from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is David Plyler. I'm with the Concert Office in the Music Division at the Library of Congress. And we've got kind of a great uh, group of people here to talk about some of the music that we're going to hear today. Two composers and two of the performers. Um, from the end, we have Eric Hubner, pianist, uh, Gabriela Diaz, uh, violinist, Roger Reynolds, composer, and Eric Nathan, composer. And we're very pleased to have everybody here. And um, what we're gonna do is maybe speak a little bit to the pieces that Eric is playing first. He's actually playing um, in all of the pieces today, I think. Yeah. Um, but uh, because so he has a chance to go uh, get ready and same with Gabby as well. Um, so first of all, thank you all for being here and thanks for this kind of phenomenal program that we're going to be able to hear. Um, the opening uh, involves some of the smaller scale stuff before we get to the, to the bigger things. And I thought, um, while it would be interesting to talk about the Warren and Sonata, while I have you here, maybe we could talk about the solo piano etudes that you'll be playing. Um, these are uh, a set of, uh, a selection of, of etudes from book one of Roger Reynolds. Uh, two books total? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, I thought, first of all, I just wanted to get your impressions of the piece and what, what it is that you, uh, enjoy about them. I heard you playing them just a few minutes ago and was enthralled. Uh, so I, I, I have some other specific questions, but maybe just to see first what you... Well, say. thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, the etudes I'll be playing today are a selection of three etudes uh, from book one. And um, uh, one of the unique features of, uh, you know, generally books of etudes, if we think about the Ligeti etudes, um, or even the Chopin etudes. They are somewhat short, brief, discrete pieces. Um, and so in, this, in Roger's collection, uh, his idea, uh, one of the ideas was to uh, try to, um, uh, to invite the performer really to construct a kind of uh, through performance of several of the etudes or, or all of the etudes, depending on how you do it, um, and to connect these uh, various etudes with excerpts from uh, one particular etude in the book called Mercurial. So today, um, as I'm just playing a short selection, I'll, I'll play uh, uh, Fixities, which is the uh, last etude of book one, and then connect that with the etude Mercurial, um, which repeats, and then I jump off directly uh, from Mercurial into uh, Alternation, which is the third etude I'll play. Um, when I do these as a set, I, I uh, uh, put sort of excerpts from Mercurial in between almost each etude. Uh, and in that way, it becomes a kind of complete uh, uninterrupted performance. Um, one other uh, unique feature, which um, you'll, you'll, those that are uh, paying attention will, I, I think, catch, uh, is the use of quotation in the etudes. Uh, and in particular, the etudes I'm playing today really uh, draw uh, there are excerpts that you'll hear from Chopin and Debussy primarily, um, quite noticeably the beginning of uh, Fixities. Um, uh, and uh, later on, you'll hear the Winter Wind Etude and the, the Etude in Sixth from Chopin <coughs> and others. So um, these quotes are sort of woven into uh, the fabric of the piece, and I think in some cases maybe even inspired the texture of the Etude itself as kind of a point of origin maybe for the pieces uh, as, you, as you wrote them, um, so. Well, great, I mean, it's in particular, just from what I was hearing with the, referencing the C-sharp minor from Opus 25, in, that's in fixities, right, the, at the, um, it's, it's very clear at the, very, at the beginning, and, um, but one of the things that, that struck me about it is that it um, evokes it and, and kind of moves away from it uh, simultaneously, and it was, uh, not, it made me think of not in a, um, uh, I, I think of this in a positive way, the, the, the Godovsky types of, that's the one A2 that he actually didn't uh, do a uh, version of. Right, right. Um, but, right. Uh, uh, the Man of All. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. But there's this, um, one thing that it's just, 
it comes to mind as being a very uh, clear reference, but the, the etude nature of that one is such a, in some ways such a musical one. It's the, 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 well, of course, there's the technical issues in the left hand that we're dealing with. It's also a very musical choice. So maybe, Roger, you could say something about um, that particular focus or anything else you'd like to say. Yeah, well, I, I mentioned in other contexts recently that <coughs> I used to be very opposed to the idea of quotation, and I think my position was simply, if you're a composer, you should have your own ideas, and you should let those that others have done uh, well stay where they are and you know, be, uh, you know, maintain their own uh, integrity and so on. Uh, I, I did a piece uh, in the late 80s which referenced uh, work by Mahler and Beethoven, and that is a text that, uh, by John Ashbery that uh, referred to music. So I thought, well, I need to look at these pieces. And in doing so, I created a kind of harmonic uh, basis for this piece, which is for string orchestra. And even though it quoted very few lines, it quoted in the sense of the harmonic space and the nature of Beethoven's approach to sonority and, and, uh, and Mahler's. And I have to say, of course, that I found it incredibly fascinating. And so after that, I decided, well, maybe quotes are all right. <laughs> but in order to use quotes in an honorable way, you have to use uh, a segment of you know, some substantial duration, which is absolutely clearly what the composer wrote. right? And my task is to be in my own musical space, which of course is all, always desirable and even inevitable, but to modify that and kind of modulate my own way of thinking into the way in which I imagine Chopin or this or Debussy or Ligeti, whatever we're thinking uh, when they made their music. So my task is to go from here, from us in our time and my w way of dealing with music into that past just for a moment and then come out of it again. So I find this uh, very intriguing and rewarding because it gives me, uh, it gives me a relationship to uh, the great past of the Western tradition. And in my case, I was originally sort of a pianist and I played some etudes, sort of. And uh, I mean, I say that in the presence of Eric who does a lot more than sort of. And I wanted to actually say just briefly, I know they're, they're on their way out soon, but uh, for both uh, Gabby and Eric, the, the, the most wonderful thing for me that can happen for a composer is that a performer uh, takes, invests in and inhabits the work such that it seems to become theirs. And it's such a pleasure to give up one's own anxieties and so on and feel that when Eric or when Gabby are playing, it's really their music. So I just get to enjoy it. <laughs> you know, and another, another thought just on these um, etudes is that uh, there's a part of the virtuosity, I think, at least in what I was just hearing just now, is in not only the composer's ability to integrate these different ideas into something that doesn't feel modular and it's like, you know, quote, 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 or something like that, but also for you as a performer to be able to, it seems like part of the etude is um, constructing that as a, as a very uh, real and uh, genuine type of uh, interpretation of it. And I think that you do that marvelously. And th do, you, do you find that you change, given the variability that Roger puts into the piece, do you find that you change it with each performance or do you settle on something? Or? It, yeah, I mean, that's, that's one of the, most, I think, unusual aspects for me in playing these pieces that, um, depending on the order of the etudes, uh, uh, today is unique. I've never done just three like, uh, like this before. Um, and, and kind of where these quotes come and how I'm feeling when I arrive at them and all of that. Um, uh, how the piano is feeling. I mean, an etude is so technical often and, and so how the piano feels is, is uh, you, you hear, th you know, you, you adapt your playing to the instrument, um, for especially in a very technical kind of a piece. Um, uh, so th so the, the, the sort of uh, psychological context uh, always seems a little different, and so I, I always like to experiment slightly with how I interpret, particularly the quotes, because they are so recognizable. Um, 
and how I sort of try to fit fit those into the context of the piece. Um, you know, they're they're like Roger said, they're in this. He's in the space of of this other composer uh, momentarily, um, and so how it how that folds back into the body of the work is is one of those sort of challenges for an interpreter is to make it organic and. Um, but how I do that, I feel, is always kind of changing. <laughs> and it just is never really uh, set. <laughs> so it's fun that way. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, maybe, Eric, before we have you go, um, could you maybe say a few words about the Warren and Megalith? Uh, oh. I was just thinking, um, that's, a, that's a piece that, um, uh, it's a fairly new piece, I think, from 2015 or so. Um, but it features piano and uh, chamber and ensemble. Maybe you could say a few words about that. Yeah, so uh, Megalith, is, it's on the second half, and it's a piano and chamber concerto, um, although not really a concerto in, in the traditional sense. Um, there aren't uh, extended solo passages for, for piano or anything like that. It's, it's almost like an ensemble piece with a piano, with a featured piano part. Um, and I think it's a really, uh, well, it was written for the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra and Peter Serkin who premiered it, and uh, I think it's a, it's a very uh, fine example of sort of this uh, uh, late Warren and style, which is really, uh, things are, are quite distilled, the textures are, are still somewhat angular, but um, there's a lot more uh, sustained playing and sort of s open uh, resonant space in the piece um, than, uh, than even the violin sonata, which is uh, an, a slight, somewhat earlier work, which we're playing in, uh, we're opening the program with, uh, which is much more, uh, with much busier, a much busier work. Um, Megalith is, is, as the title would sort of indicate, just these kind of granitic, uh, geometric shapes. Um, and there's a brief, fast passage in the middle, but really it's this sort of sustained uh, sculpture-like uh, texture. Um, and uh, I personally just find, you know, the the sound, the, the kind of integration of the piano into the ensemble and the orchestration uh, in particular to be uh, very beautiful, particularly as the piece sort of moves uh, towards, its, uh, towards its sort of coda. Um, it's very, yeah. Have the two of you played the sonata before together? No. no? <laughs> what was that experience like, maybe Gabby, uh, putting that together? <laughs> um, it's been really fun. <laughs> Uh, Eric is c completely amazing, and it's been <laughs> it's it is a very dense piece, and there's there's a lot going on a lot of the time, and so I think it's really important to feel like you trust <laughs> your partner <laughs> in those situations, um, and so it's been really fun. And I, you know, I have not played a lot of Warnum um, in my life so far. Eric has, so that's also been really awesome and useful to someone who has a lot of experience with his music. Um, to be able to do this together and for the first time, I think has been a really great experience. But definitely, it's a very exciting and um, in it, uh, it, it's it, it it was interesting because I had not heard Megalith before, so I was listening to it in in the run through, and I was struck at how different the the pieces are because the violin sonata, in a sense, feels more like there are these moments of real like flow and really like slow beautiful music, and then this sort of like really frenetic and frenzied music. And it sort of goes in between those two characters more, whereas Megalith feels like, yeah, very solid. <laughs> well, I would add a, a, a mo point here because uh, I, uh, we have been rehearsing the, the Boston Modern Orchestra project has been rehearsing in Boston. And I have been there for the rehearsals and I've been staying in Gabby and her husband Jeff's home. And uh, Eric has been there and they've been rehearsing. And so I heard the first moments, right, <laughs> and and the uh, speaking of rawness, you know, and the direct and just, you know, what are the notes? Where are they? When when are we together? And so on. And this went on for a, a certain period of time, and then after a break, or maybe we had lunch or something at one point or dinner, and then when they went back, suddenly it's music. <laughs> Everything matters, and that sort of mattering aspect of it. Hearing that happen is uh, that's a great treat. I often say I, I like rehearsals better than performances. <laughs> often, just because they're more revealing of what's going on and what's being attempted. 
Well, maybe we can uh, say goodbye to Eric now just so you have a chance to go, but thanks so much. <laughs> Gabby, to, to be able to, uh, maybe we can speak a bit about uh, aspiration and your, um, maybe you can tell us a bit about your uh, history with uh, working with Rogers Music and then a bit about this piece. Uh, so I've been lucky to do quite a number of projects with Roger. Um, he came to Boston a few years ago and I was able, lucky enough to get to play one of his other violin sort of future pieces with ensemble called Personae, which is really, really gorgeous work. That was also with BMOP, actually. Um, and he also has a really incredible uh, solo violin piece called Kokoro, which I also <laughs> have played many times. And actually, we're in the process now of recording a CD and that will have these three pieces, Persone, Kokoro, and then Aspiration, which we'll record on Monday. Um, so that's, that's all with BMOP that's sound. That's all with BMOP sound, yeah, on the BMOP label. So that's a very exciting project. And it's been great to get to know Roger and to get to know his music this way and to have so, so many chances to work together. It's been really, really fantastic. Um, and Aspiration is a really beautiful piece. It's, I think, maybe slightly unusual in a concerto style piece that I get to have five cadenzas, <laughs> not just one. <laughs> um, and those are, are really interesting moments in the piece. Um, the first cadenza is incredibly lyrical, um, and Roger was saying, you know, sort of like the, the ensemble sets up sort of like a magic carpet that I get to go on a ride on. <laughs> uh, and then the second cadenza is totally the opposite of that. It's super, super energetic, um, almost sort of stubborn in its rhythmic energy. Uh, the third cadenza is a mix of those two things. And then the fourth cadenza is sort of the most has the most sort of harmonic sense of there's more chords where I'm playing harmony with myself instead of needing an ensemble to, to feature that. Um, and then the last cadenza is sort of more rhythmic where there's a more steady rhythmic sense. Uh, and so it's really interesting in the course of the piece where there's also all this other music where I am playing with the ensemble and then I sort of get to emerge in these cadenzas that are very, very different and distinct from each other. Yeah, and in that piece, there are no quotes what whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. uh, it didn't seem needed. <laughs> but in any case, uh, I can't uh, do this while also uh, holding the microphone. Uh, maybe I can figure out how to do it. <laughs> but the piece is, is sort of like this. It's the cadenzas, and then the ensemble fits in. So there are two worlds. There's the world of the ensemble, which starts quite featureless. Uh, that is to say, everybody's playing, but there is no thematic material. There are no explicit melodic things. There's just texture and, and glitter. And uh, there's a, a very um, you know, noticeable rising uh, moment in the piano, which comes back twice during this first one and comes back throughout the whole piece. That is, it's a kind of uh, arpeggiated entrance into a space. And uh, it happens in its own time. So the ensemble has begins high and uh, featureless and ends very low and very explicitly gestural. So it acquires uh, a voice, a ponderous, a dramatic voice as the piece goes on. I should be saying this, I guess. So, uh, whereas uh, Gabby is actually playing almost her own piece. So these pieces begin to influence each other and the violin takes more of the textural ideas from the ensemble. The ensemble becomes more articulate. I think you'll hear quite specifically that, that there's a, there are borrowings and taking of different roles as time goes on. But the, the idea here is to, to give the soloist, in a sense, her own piece. So the orchestra, uh, which she also plays with, has its own music. Uh, she joins with it, she challenges it, it challenges her, and then she has her own space that she can go to. And when I first wrote this piece, it was, uh, was written for an another uh, dear colleague, as Gabby is, uh, Irvin Arditi, and I sent him an email about the piece, and I said, oh, it's called Aspiration. And he said, that's an odd name for a piece. But I always have thought it was really the right one, because... Uh, you, it, it aspires to do different kinds of things, 
throughout the whole piece in staged ways, and uh, hopefully you will feel inspired by aspiring <laughs> musicians, especially your wonderful Gabby. You speak of some of the um, kind of different roles that the ensemble plays and the soloist plays in this. Um, are those trajectories uh, of one of a kind of accretion that you talked about with the ensemble, uh, do those remain through the entire piece? And that, or do, are the, do the borrowings and stuff tend to take over so that there's a more commingling towards the end? Or how does, it, uh, how does that argument play out? Is it a fairly consistent one? Well, yeah. I mean, the, when one asks more detailed and explicit questions, such as, David is also a composer, I should say. And, and uh, so the answers, let's say to give useful answers to detailed questions about strategies and so on, turns out to be awfully uh, long <laughs> and <laughs> complicated. So <coughs> I guess I would just say that um, I had had a lot of conversations with RDD about, he had started his career as the leader of the London Symphony Orchestra violin, first violin section. And he spoke about the fact that whenever a soloist came, uh, the older members of the orchestra told him, you have to turn your bow and play just with a few hairs because otherwise the modern orchestra size will simply overwhelm, swamp any soloist. And, uh, and so I vowed <coughs> that were I to write a concerto, I would try to make sure that that didn't happen. Well, it, it does, of course, because it's almost inevitable. But my design is firstly to give uh, Gabby space for her own statements, but also to allow the writing for the ensemble to change as the different uh, sections uh, happen such that there's a different kind of support for her. And I think you will find that uh, it, it the violin solo emerges more and more as the piece goes on while the orchestra is playing in addition to the, uh, the solo cadenzas. So, there was a lot of thought that went into explicitly that issue. But one, one has to say that in a hall like this, which is very resonating, very bright, when 15 musicians are playing, even if they're playing very, 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 very quietly, it's still loud. <laughs> uh, the, there's just a energy in the air. And so it's, it's a reality. And what I did for the solo violin part was to give Gabby a lot of uh, sudden, very energetic scalar interjections. So she's playing along in a more normal way, and then she has this jagged thing that she does, almost like saying, me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so you'll, you'll hear that too. So one, uh, one thing that's good to know is that when pe with people in there, it does change the sound quite a bit on stage and, and in the audience too, so hope that'll, that'll help to ameliorate those, those <laughs> issues. But, um, Gabby, maybe before you go, uh, can you just say anything about uh, other projects that you have going on right now, or that your other pieces you're working on, what you're up to? Sure. Um, I in uh, two two weeks, I'll be. I'm on the faculty of a festival at New England Conservatory called the Summer Institute for Contemporary Performance Practice. <laughs> no, known sick, as sick, sick puppy. Sick puppy. It's much easier to say. <laughs> Um, and this summer, our composer in residence is Julian Anderson. He's a really, really interesting composer. Uh, and so I'll be playing uh, a piece of his by sol uh, for solo violin called Another Prayer. So that's coming up. Um, that's very different from Roger's music, um, but also very exciting and engaging. And also we'll be playing one of Thomas Otis's uh, string quartets, which is also a very big undertaking. So <laughs> <laughs> got to practice that after this is all over. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us. We'll let you go and uh, have a chance to get ready. But. Well, we're uh, losing speakers, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, Eric, uh, I'd like to ask you a bit about your piece. Um, uh, maybe you can just give us a little bit of background information about it and go from there. Sure. Um, well, with... My works, um, it, it tends to be that I get inspiration from 
um, recently from uh, a personal experience in a physical space. And so this did come from visiting the, the site of Greek ruins in southern Italy uh, in the city of Pestum. And uh, for those of you who may not know Pestum, uh, you have these huge um, Greek columns for these temples uh, that are probably the size of a football field um, and really uh, humongous monumenta monumental uh, structures. And then there's the whole city next to it that's only about a foot high, but you still can walk into houses and see the floor plans, but um, it's all just kind of been leveled uh, by time because this was uh, 800, 800 BC. I forget, a very, a very long time ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, so when I was there, uh, I saw, because I was experiencing this, and I, I started to hear ideas in my head. And so I actually took out my iPhone and uh, started singing in and uh, giving words to the ideas I was having. Um, so the title of the piece is Pessim, which is paying homage to uh, how this place and the, the sense of history and my being in a kind of continuum experiencing this, this, this site um, as people had for many, many years before, um, how that gave me ideas. But I think the piece itself, as most of my pieces then do, just take that maybe to get a texture or uh, an emotion and then the piece follows its own course and I follow my own characters around and uh, find where the piece leads. Um, so I think when you're listening to the piece, it, it, it may be interesting to you to, to think, oh, I, I got this idea of being in this, this, this site of ruins, um, but I think what will be most important is to, to, to listen for the, there's an incredible uh, kind of intensity and electric energy that you'll hear at the beginning and the end, and um, the performance today is actually quite quick, um, which is, upped the, the excitement level. And then in the middle section, we have this sense of kind of stillness where uh, that's when I was thinking of walking through the, the ruins of the city. I have a question for both of you. And it's in some ways, it's a simplistic question, but I know it's one that I think a lot of people have for composers. And it has to do with, um, I know a lot of Rogers music um, has particular literary references and things like that. And we're talking about um, imagery, historical references, whether they're a quotation or whether they're uh, literal sites that you visited. Um, <coughs> I guess my question is, um, is there a sense in which when people approach your music, and I understand that it's gonna be different for every piece and et cetera, um, that th these types of uh, perceptions are important to for them to understand that there's this imagery, whether that be um, historical, visible, audible, whatever it is. Um, is that an important entry point? Is it something that can be, is just an interesting side note? Is it something that's integral? I'll just leave it there and maybe have you both speak about that. Um, well, I, I think about 10 years ago, it was, it was important to me. I was writing a lot of works based on, inspired by artworks, paintings, and then uh, places. And, um, but I, in hindsight, I think that my use of these external sources for inspiration were, were in a sense scaffolding that helped me come up, uh, arrive at new ideas and maybe find ideas within myself that I wouldn't necessarily have arrived at. Um, so for these pieces, I don't um, think it actually helps per se to, to know what I think, and actually for me personally, the longer I, I get from a, a piece that maybe have had, had a very specific inspiration, the less I feel it's important, and the more the piece takes on its own life, and I, I find what it, it says something to me differently as the, as the years progress, and I actually had a really interesting uh, conversation with a Lyft driver when I was in LA last week, and we were listening to classical music on the radio, and there was a, a piano piece, and I said, Oh, this piece it, 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 it tells a story, and and Jose, the the driver, says, um, um, it does. But uh, the story it tells you is your own story, and so I thought that was incredibly beautiful. And 
it's what I have been thinking about, especially I do a lot of composing for instrumental music without text, and so what can a piece of music without text actually say specifically to, to give specific meaning? And I think the beauty of what I've been experiencing is that as I'm on a different, even two days in a row, I may hear different things in a piece, and especially as Ro Roger was speaking about with Eric and Gabby, when a performer's start to really know your music, even their interpretations or different performers' interpretations get you to see your own work in a new light. And so today I actually um, started to, to see this in a, in a different way than I had before, and it was exciting to, to see it breathe in a new way. So I'm, I'm very much in accord with everything you're saying, so that, that's very nice. Great. It isn't always <laughs> that way, of course, with <laughs> colleagues, but I, I, I'm, I can identify very much with everything Eric has been saying. Um, I think that this issue of, um, let's say, who owns music is an important one. And um, I had a, a, a close relationship uh, with the wonderful Japanese composer Toru Takemitsu when we lived in Japan for a number of years. And uh, Toru made a uh, comment several times that was very uh, intriguing, and that was that when a piece was performed, uh, a new piece, let's say that you or I or, or Takemitsu wrote, and then the piece was not performed for a long period of time, and then it was redone again in some different place in the globe, by performers who'd never heard the first uh, performance, maybe didn't even know it had taken place, and it was better. And he posited the notion that somehow music is up there, mm. and that what we actually do is sort of borrow a little bit of it, and, uh, and that once it's been enriched in a certain sense, then everybody benefits from that enrichment. Mm. And so, I mean, Obviously, uh, being trained originally as an engineering physicist, I, 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 I find a certain skepticism about <laughs> some things. But on the other hand, uh, it really is the case that uh, what arouses a composer to do something um, is, is really, um, it comes to life. It means more in relationship to, I think, the composer's experience than it, do, or maybe perhaps an analyst's, than it does to a listener's. Because if you're successful in writing a, a piece of music that matters to anyone other than yourself, um, you know, they, uh, the piece speaks in, in some way itself. And uh, I think the meanings, uh, the motivations, the identity. I mean, when we say a piece of mov music moved us, it's an interesting locution, right? And it exists in other languages, too. The idea that musical experience transports <coughs> or repositions. And, and if you've really made a good piece, then that kind of thing happens. And it's something that we can't cause to happen directly. It can't carry a message like, I love my dog. But uh, on the other hand, it carries something, and, and something that can matter a great deal. So I think that, that the fueling, as it were, of compositional projects is where these kinds of things play a really important part. Uh, they arouse us, they make us aware, as you're saying, of things we might not be uh, aware of in other contexts. But once the piece is finished, you know, it, it kind of makes its own way, ideally, in the world. And if you have the great good fortune, which is fairly rare, I have to say, to have uh, performers of this caliber uh, repeat your work. Uh, I have to say today, I mean, uh, <coughs> David has just mentioned hearing Eric uh, run through his three pieces that he's playing. I, it was totally new for me. I've heard him play these, you know, probably a dozen times in concert. But this was like, not like mm. they had been before. Now, it is, of course, the same, but on the other hand, those differences, they really matter. Hmm? You know, going back to one thing that Eric said a little bit earlier, uh, uh, but just before leaving us, um, he mentioned this, uh, the notion of uh, basically an inspired uh, source of inspiration as potentially being a, almost a scaffolding for on which mm -hmm. um, that maybe matters more to the composer at the time of composition than it does to the, you know, in the end. 
Uh, have there been uh, examples in either of your work where you've jettisoned entirely that uh, that uh, scaffolding of, of <laughs> that uh, maybe and I, I hate I hate to say extra musical, but whatever that, that uh, constructive uh, you know all the the things that you that went into the construction of that work, and it and it became something that was had a public life that was completely separate from. Uh, I, I, I think most of the works, I, I might have an idea when I start, but I, I, I kind of might map out a whole trajectory and then as I start writing, it continually shifts to based on how the characters are interacting with one another and I don't um, know, I, I think quite frequently it, it turns out that the piece says something that I did not know it was gonna say necessarily when I began, and I kind of liked that, and that if I completely knew everything, it wouldn't be as, as an exciting journey for myself, which is all to, to find out sure. where the piece leads. This kind of spooky, <laughs> because <laughs> I completely agree with that. And in fact, uh, I met my wife in the situation, like we were both students at the uh, music uh, school at the University of Michigan, and uh, she and a wonderful jazz pianist named uh, Bob James, who is still a, a major feature in American musical life, they agreed to play a flute and piano piece which I had written. And uh, this was very early when I just had not written very many pieces. So I went to the first re rehearsal and I had exactly that experience. I thought, my goodness, I had no idea that this music meant what it seems to mean, or what they found in it, you know? And uh, I think that uh, often in interviews of this sort, well, this is much better than many of them, uh, uh, the people will say, how do you imagine all that stuff in your head? How, is you, how do you know what it's gonna sound like? And my answer is, I know what every sound is going to sound like. I, when I'm writing it, I know what it's going to sound like. What I do not know is what it's going to feel like. And that experience of realizing that the thing you put together with particular kinds of intention has meanings that you had not anticipated is one of the big kicks of being a composer, and there aren't many. <laughs> I, agree. I, I feel like, sorry, with a, like with a fantastic actor taking someone's lines and imbuing it with, with with a, a new meaning, I feel it's it's quite similar with performance, and um, it is it's a, it's. A, I think we have an interesting role in that. Like if you look at a novelist, uh, they're writing the words on the page, and the reader is the audience. But we have this intermediary uh, writing notated music. We are writing something for the performer to interpret in a way that then will give to you in some vestige of what we intended, but actually it gets enriched because they're putting their own humanity in it as well. And of course, if I want something X to be said, um, do I actually write that out or do I need to write it in a way that can be interpreted that way? So for instance, if you take Aretha Franklin and the uh, am amazing melismas and uh, 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 kind of, uh, embracing, uh, embroidering notes that she uses in her solos, if I were to write that out exactly, specifically, a performer may not be able to play with as much abandon as she does, um, and that if you write it a little bit uh, looser, and, and maybe then say, take some, play this with, with uh, great feeling, or uh, behind the beat or something, you get this other result. So there's, there's it's, it's also a, a kind of, a an experiment throughout the process too, to, yeah. to figure out if I want this to be said, how do I get it to happen, right? And usually with orchestras, you, you only really have one shot. <laughs> <laughs> you come in, uh, it was with the Boston Symphony, they premiered a work of mine about a year and a half ago, and we got uh, 20 minutes on the first rehearsal, and my piece is 12 minutes long, and the second rehearsal was 15 minutes. And basically, they ran through the piece, touched a section, second rehearsal, ran the piece, touched the section, dress rehearsal, ran the piece. Um, so there wasn't a lot of time to have anything <laughs> not be the way it would uh, needs to come out. But then also watching a group even over four performances 
grow with her work. It's it's amazing just to to see the that level of uh, someone putting their the humanity into it. At at the risk of getting back into a more weedy type of thing, I would like to maybe just go back one more time to this notion of structural um, underpinnings, whatever those are. Mm -hmm. And I know I've, I've talked with Roger about this in the past, but um, for both of you again, um, what level of commitment or discipline um, do you require of yourself once you've made certain types of decisions about what a piece is going to be or how it's going to uh, come together um, is that something that uh, develops over the course of, a, again, this is an unfair question because it's going to be different for every piece, likely, but is that something that develops over the course of the composition, or is it something where you um, allow whatever source of inspiration uh, might be there uh, to help to define the, the technical parameters of, of one's construction? I think that, um, well, my father was an architect, and I studied uh, engineering. And so I became conscious at a very early age without thinking about it at all, that thinking ahead, that planning was a valuable thing to do. And my father was a very taciturn person and he just, he took me to the site of a school that he had was building and uh, he had virtually nothing to say. He was looking at his plans and what th how the thing was developing. And he just turned to me and he said, if you don't design it right, it collapses. And I thought, well, there are consequences to an architect making a mistake, right? And there aren't those same consequences for a composer. But um, I, f I feel uh, from the beginning, I was uh, very much believe that having an idea of the nature of the journey on which you're setting out is really crucial to optimizing that journey and the product that comes from it. So at the beginning, of course, I did very uh, kind of vague, impressionistic sketches of things. Subsequently, at a certain point, I got to making very specific and detailed plans for pieces, which I call landscapes of opportunity. That is, they don't tell me exactly what I'm going to do, but they tell me the sort of layout of the experience. And sometimes they're, they're really, uh, you know, very detailed. And I, that turns out, even though it wasn't my intention at the beginning, now I don't know if this will be true for Eric, but um, it, it became very clear to me that life in our time is incredibly fragmented. Everything is, every, everything is broken, everything is broken up and having time, quiet time in the mind, is virtually impossible. So it, it, I discovered over time with a very busy and demanding life as a professor at the University of California and an artist trying to you know, make his music that matters, uh, that having these kinds of very specific structural commitments uh, is immensely valuable because what it means is if I have a spare moment, morning, I can do something. Because I'm not trying to hold the entire project in my mind at the same time. I have a lot of predispositions for things and I can go into that moment and I can work on that little thing knowing that it will be okay in the larger picture. So I feel that especially in our time, having these kinds of disciplines, which aren't rule-based, but are principle-based, uh, is absolutely essential. I can't imagine how I could do what I do without that. Well, I, re I, I now just started teaching. I'm at Brown now, just finished my third year, and I, I'm finding the same <laughs> difficulties of finding those times, and uh, where I've kind of been doing in, in the semesters writing works with many short movements so I can kind of stay within one world. But to write a longer work, it, this is, is very helpful to just keep, that's a great idea to, to help you through it. Um, I, I find it very enjoyable to talk about the kind of big picture ideas of my inspiration and how I might think about engaging with the music. But when it comes down to it, it's an incredibly detailed process where really all, 
the, I guess the, the inspiration gives me some sort of emotional fuel through the, the music, but it's really thinking about motive, texture, harmony, register, um, rhythm, proportions. Proportions, uh, I find, that for me, are, are incredibly important. So for thinking about form, um, when I'm in a certain part of the piece, seeing what comes next or how much longer to do this uh, is, is both looking and analyzing what I've written, like putting my music theorist hat on and saying, why is this working the way it is? But then I feel there's also a sense of intuition too, where it's almost uh, kind of like a dialogue between my conscious mind and my unconscious saying, where does the piece want to go? And of course the piece is, though it feels like it might be uh, after I, I create it like a, a kid that's gone out and becomes its own thing, uh, identity, whether it does what I want it to do or not. Um, but uh, I feel that that, w that a piece saying what it wants to do comes from um, perhaps some unconscious uh, sense, uh, dialogue between expectation and uh, uh, a sense of expectation of what I have heard in previously in my life and how I'm hearing this moment and how does that, uh, what, what are some possible outcomes to, to this scenario musically. Um, so there is this uh, intuitive sense versus this very detail-oriented. And teaching composition, I, I, I have been, I, th I feel like it's actually helped me become a better composer because I'm dealing with l students' problems of the more technical side uh, on a very frequent basis. And so now it's actually helped with the uh, composing in academia that when I have the s winter break of three weeks, I, I write three times faster than I used to <laughs> be able to. What uh, go ahead, Roger. Yeah. No, I, w I was, I had a thought, and now I, I think it may have fled. Uh, <laughs> um, let's see, just, oh, that's too bad, because it was very nice. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take your word on it. <laughs> well, what I was thinking is that um, we're just about out of time, but if you're willing to, uh, we get to take a few questions from the audience, if there are any. And if you do have a question, if you could wait for a microphone to come to you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you uh, for all being here. I wanted to ask you uh, if there could be a brief discussion on the role of awards and prizes in helping to promote uh, contemporary classical music. Uh, earlier this year, the, uh, the Pulitzer Prize in music was awarded to a rap artist who, uh, his music is already very well known, it is commercially very successful, and uh, that's a bit of a new thing for the Pulitzer to go to someone that doesn't already have a lot of attention. And I've kind of wondered about the role of an award such as the Pulitzer Prize in helping to bring attention uh, to music and to artists that are currently unknown. We've had such a congenial conversation. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very inflammatory <laughs> subject. Uh, uh, and I don't, I don't, I mean, I have a lot to say about that, <laughs> but I'm not sure I should say it. So, you know, wh what, how, how would you, in a more genteel fashion, approach? Well, well, I can say one thing I w would say is that um, it, is, it is something that, um, uh, not to, to uh, I think that what matters much more than, I think awards have a place. Um, to me, when I'm looking at a piece, I don't care if it has an award, because a lot of times, um, while that, that can give somebody some, a leg up or some status or whatever it is, if I'm not engaged with the work that they're doing, then, um, then, that's, then I'm not having a, a valuable artistic experience. I'm going to base my interactions with them based on what I uh, experience. So I always, while that's, it's always nice and we, we have a tendency, especially in bios and stuff, we, we list out all the awards and stuff that we get because that's an easy way to understand it. I think it's always just a better, uh, a better approach is to uh, uh, look at a, a composer that you don't know and get to know what their work is and then, and then develop a, a response based on that. And that, that's maybe uh, as that, yeah. <laughs> that's a much more civil <laughs> response. So I'm I'm just going to say a couple of things. So uh, okay. So actually, um, the 
this is our society treats art in a very utilitarian way, and it always has from the very beginning. Art is about money, right? It is not about depth. It is not about societal impact. It's about money. Are you famous? Are you getting lots of hits? Are you, you know, selling two million copies, et cetera, et cetera? And this issue, the idea of that money is a proper metric for artistic achievement is appalling. And, uh, you know, there's, th there's a deeply, well, there's a, a musicologist named Richard Crawford who's written a brilliant book about the, the way the, the colonists at the very beginning, the composers like Law and Billings and so on, they were not paid to compose. They were paid to conduct the band on Sunday afternoon and to conduct the choir. It was utilitarian, for use, that's it, okay? So in our society, the aggrandized uh, you know, public awareness of uh, science is immense. Science congratulates itself all the time. And art doesn't have either the means or perhaps even the will to congratulate itself. But this is, I think, the, uh, the idea of, shall we say, just recognition, mm -hmm. not prizes per se. But the idea that the work that a person does is actually understood to have significance and that that significance maybe is not going to be appropriately gauged by the numbers of millions of copies of, of uh, records or, or uh, you know, downloads or whatever is done, but in, in some different way. And that leads me to say that the idea that uh, you know, a particular medium which has been honored traditionally through a particular process such as the Pulitzer Prize, that it suddenly becomes an award that covers all areas of musical uh, achievement, whatever, and in particular areas where the public recognition and the remunerative aspects are, are just off the charts, so to speak. Why would we take uh, you know, a, a situation in which one applauds or recognizes briefly uh, significant uh, achievement as a poet, let's say, uh, a short story writer, a composer, whatever, a choreographer, um, and, and then say that we're going to give this recognition to somebody who is already immensely well rewarded in his or her public role. It is, to my mind, just, you know, it's a ghastly situation. And this is not to say that all people who create don't have merit, that they don't have function within the society, and so of course they do. The question is, in various ways, do we honor people enough already as a result of the way they live and the way they are noted? Because you know that the art which is transient is built in order to be that, right? The whole idea is there has to be a new one next month or we're out of business. But that's not the way we work. And, and so, et cetera. Um, sorry. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I would say that those who do get awards tend to be ones, those that also get many awards. So two, those are the people who have won the Pulitzer Prize. If you look at John Adams, for instance, won, has won many awards in his life. Um, I do think that giving recognition to an artwork is really important. Um, and I think today the idea of genre is is is, is not as um, set as it had has been in the past. And that uh, I going back to what the my the, the Lyft driver I was with uh, the music this story it tells you is your story, and that can apply to any whether the music is making millions of dollars or it's not making millions of dollars. And I think. Kendrick Lamar's um, album Dam and the, his album Pretend the Butterfly are absolutely fantastic works of art and um, are very deserving of, a, of an award. And there are many, many people who are also deserving of the award that don't get it. Um, and so if there will be more awards, more recognition. Um, I, I know one of the issues is that, that when the Grammys for classical music get announced, it's not done on national television. So people don't find out about it as, as much. So if there, if 
Pulitzer Prize has been one of the, the ways that, that this award um, uh, recognition comes to people composing in um, the, the more, quote, classical world, but I think that the, the boundaries are really, uh, genre lines are, are, are blurring what is uh, a work of art music. And I would, I teach a course at um, Brown that I call From the Blues to Beyonce, and it's for non-majors, and it, uh, it looks at popular music in the 20th and 21st centuries through the lenses of race, gender, class, technology, the industry, um, and just looking at this, mu the, the course is culminates with Lemonade, which I think another very worthy piece, uh, work of art with the video that goes along with it that says it's an incredibly powerful um, uh, journey that we put you on. You know, one other last thing I would like to say, and then we'll have one more question, is that there's, um, there's also a tendency with awards for a snowball effect. And like you said, there are people who get lots of awards. Sometimes it's the fact that they get awards that leads them to get further awards and things like that. And so I, it, it just takes me back to, I, I know, and I'm sure we all know, so many composers, musicians, people who deserve recognition who do not get it at all. And so the, I, to me, uh, beyond the larger societal questions of how we do that publicly, um, what I feel like I can do is get to know their music personally and try to exp seek it out and explore it. And that's something positive that I can do as an individual to, and, and try to support them as best I can. You know, that's just something else. Maybe one more question back. Yeah, I wanted to get back to the, the music, um, but in the intersection of technology <coughs> and capabilities and the oral, AU, RAL, um, accessibility to contemporary music, contemporary being last century and this century. Um, I was interested in your comments in, in each of your um, exposures and thinking in composing how technology, and I saw a plot on log paper um, in the exhibit area there, um, the um, hearer's receptivity and connection with contemporary music in your thinking as you're composing a piece um, and also perhaps commenting on the general directions of music that went in that very mathematical sort of technical arena and I think perhaps there's some swing back now more. Um, so I'm just curious if that's more comprehensible. Um, your take on the intersection of technical and art and the hearer and how that feeds back into your composition. <laughs> Again, <laughs> kind of, uh, we could be here all day and all night. Uh, no. um, okay, a couple of things quickly. Um, I I've, uh, also uh, have experiences, as Eric is mentioning, with uh, students of different levels of sophistication. And uh, when the, the movie Avatar came out, which was of course, in terms of uh, special effects and so on, really spectacular, and especially in 3D. And if I asked my, you know, undergraduate students uh, whether, if they're looking at uh, Avatar on their iPhones, it's it's the same work, and they they say yes, and I say no, 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 it's it, that isn't Avatar. That's that's a pale, you know symbol that suggests Avatar, but it is not Avatar. The same kind of thing when I give uh, talks to general audiences about music, I have a square wave version of a Bach invention that I play, and it's very, very dry. There's no inflection whatsoever. And I ask the audience, is that music? And most people say yes, and I say no, it's not music. And then I play a little bit from Peter Serkin's recording of the Bach inventions that he did for his children. And you can hardly keep from dancing. You know, it's so animated. But the difference between the absolutely objective representation and Serkin's is in the fractions of a percent, right? Otherwise, they really are identical. So I think technology brings to us immense uh, new potential 
But the crucial thing from my point of view is how is it experienced? And if it's not experienced, it's like experiencing uh, the great works of Bach not in a church. It's just in, in some very fundamental way, it's not right. You know, it, 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 it's at war with the, the moment that, that that composer addressed in his or her work, you know? So uh, I find technology immensely rewarding and interesting, but it has to be done right. And most orchestras, for example, if you have a work that has an electroacoustic aspect, there's no time set aside to rehearse the sound as it's projected, which is different in every space. And to get, I mean, for example, Boulez came to Los Angeles many years ago with his first great uh, work, Le Pont, and the Los Angeles Philharmonic was uh, you know, sponsoring the program, and they had put no time whatsoever for the musical technology to be set up and tested and tuned. So Boulez actually had to threaten to cancel the concert. He said, if we do not have the entire day before to rehearse, then we are not playing. And of course, he had the weight to make that happen. So it's a very complicated thing. And you have to do keep in mind that a bassoon is also a technological wonder, right? It w and an organ. We're not just talking about uh, computer synthesis. Music is full of machines, miraculous machines. Hmm? So I, I hate to cut us off, but we're just out of time at this point. So if you could join me in thanking both Roger Reynolds and Eric Nathan for. <laughs> This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.